What we're going to be today, doing today is um, really focusing on some very broad generic traits of how you go from a non-chaotic system to a chaotic system, right? So this is what's known as the transition to chaos. We've actually seen a little bit of this in the, uh, in the first couple of lectures, where we saw in non-linear systems what's known as period doubling and how that can lead a uh, system can, to become chaotic. Um, we're going to be reusing a lot of the models that, we, uh, that we've been seeing so far, so the logistic map. We'll have another look at the Lorenz system as well, which we introduced in the first lecture. And we'll also uh, be introducing a slightly, uh, a slightly new problem, which is known as the uh, transition to turbulence, which has been a problem that has um, uh, troubled physicists for a very long time. So, first of all, quick recap of what we did yesterday, right? So we proposed a brief definition of what a complex system is in terms of these uh, interacting subparts with the notion of feedback really being key here. And we saw that in certain cases, feedback could have a destabilizing effect, that it could lead a system to change entirely its behavior. So that was the example of the uh, snowball earth, right? If you remember, it, there was a, a positive feedback mechanism which led the, uh, the, earth, the Earth's climate system to go from being, you know, from resembling our current Earth climate to basically the Earth being covered in uh, entirely in ice. So that was something that already starts to look a little bit like chaos, right? Because we, if you remember, one of the features of chaos when we were looking at the logistic map was something that was known as structural instability, meaning that a slight change in parameter, so in the starvation rate in a, in a population, for instance, a slight change in this, uh, in this parameter will lead to a dramatic change in the whole structure of the model, the whole qualitative types of behaviors that you would, be, you would be expecting to see. So this thing, this sensitivity, is a hallmark of chaos in the same way that sensitive dependence on initial conditions also is. And we saw that sensitive dependence on initial conditions was somehow captured in positive feedback, right? You remember when we had this exponential epidemic curve that if we were slightly mistaken as to the number of initial patients, we ended up having a very large mistake in the number of uh, patients 10, 12 weeks afterwards. So, one of the things that I come touched upon really in the intro introductory lecture was this notion that chaos really crops up in a very wide variety of systems. So we sort of looked at a very at simple demographics uh, models, but that was the logistic map. We also saw the um, that chaos could uh, could occur in oscillating systems, and like the Duffing oscillator, which we saw as well, and. This will come up as well in your weather models. It will come up in climate models. So clearly. The content, the physical content of the model can't matter that much if we're seeing the same kinds of behaviors crop up again and again. So there must be something that is what's known as universal in chaos, right? Something that doesn't depend on the sort of like fine details of what you're studying. Because if the same behavior crops up in a one-dimensional discrete map or in a continuous oscillator differential equation, then clearly you know, that behavior can't really have anything to do with the details of the dynamics. It has to be generic, universal behavior. And this is what we're going to see today, basically. So that, those are the two the, the questions we'll really be answering today. So the first one is simply, so how do we get that qualitative shift in behavior, right? How do we get from a, a system that behaves in a periodic fashion, like the logistic map in certain, uh, when the, for certain parameter values, to a, uh, to a system that behaves chaotically, that no longer has any kind of steady state, which really never settles anywhere and keeps uh, changing quite dramatically. Then we'll read, so we'll have a, we'll have a look at what's known as period doubling, which, is, uh, which we kind of touched upon um, in, a, in the third lecture, I believe. And we'll see how that, how that can lead in a fairly universal way to, uh, to chaos. And we'll see that this is a possible explanation as to why such different systems can behave in so similar ways. So the first thing we're going to do here is uh, we're just going to have a quick look at the, uh, the different systems we're going to study, right? To kind of refresh our memory about what it is that, uh, what are the physical models that we're really studying. And then we'll, um, we'll add a little something which I haven't really talked about so far, which is a common feature that chaos has to something that seems completely unrelated, which is known as the theory of phase transitions. Uh, so simple phase transitions is just you, you boil water. The water goes from liquid to gas, right? So we'll see that surprisingly enough, the physics of certain types of phase transitions actually have very similar behavior to those of chaotic systems, right? And this was a very deep insight, right? Which was, uh, which was pointed out in the, in the 70s by, uh, by Mitch Feigenbaum, and which really unlocked a sort of deeper understanding of why it is that, cha that chaotic models behave in the way they do. And in particular, this introduces the, no the notion of scaling, which I'll touch upon today, but will 
reintroduce more thoroughly tomorrow, uh, because I don't know if some of you have already sort of like seen certain um, uh, you know images of fractals and things like that. These are very often associated with chaos, and fractals are associated with scaling. Okay, so first of all. This is a very ancient problem, right? This is what's known as the transition to turbulence. And you can see already how that might have some things to do with the transition to chaos, right? Because, so imagine this is, you know, just the smoke from a cigarette, for instance. So at first, you all know that the, the column of smoke will just rise in this fairly orderly fashion, right? So this is very simple to describe in, a, in, in fluid dynamics. This is what's known as laminar flow, right? Which means that basically layers of fluid remain more or less parallel to each other. They can go at different speeds, but roughly the dynamics is that, right? One layer goes like that, one layer goes like that. Different speeds, maybe, but they remain parallel. And then at some point, something weird happens. At some point, as this, as the, um, uh, as this, uh, this column of smoke accelerates and you start getting small perturbations due to you know, air fluctuations in the air around it, you start getting these little walls. So these little swirls like that. And here, this is the transition to a qualitatively different type of behavior. So here, you see this is kind of orderly. You could still imagine that this has some kind of mathematical description, but very quickly, even this behavior disappears, right? There's a transition here, and then suddenly, and then towards the end, you have full turbulence, right? So turbulent flow is characterized by just pockets of air, or of, uh, in these case, of, of particles, really just swirling around in no particularly orderly fashion. And this thing never settles, right? This laminar flow, it's a steady state. You can write down an equation and say, well, this flow is going to be the same in time, right? The, uh, the layers of fluid are going to run parallel to each other. I can write down the equation, and I know how this is, that this is not going to shift in time. As you go to the turbulent regime, there is no longer a steady state. There is, there's no, um, you could observe this thing for as long as you want. You would never be able to really find a kind of final equilibrium state in which it settles. It will just remain swirling around forever. And we, as we've seen, this is something that kind of looks like chaos, right? Because if you remember, one of the features of the uh, logistic map, for instance, was that when it was non-chaotic, at some point it, was, it would either settle to a constant or it would oscillate. So these are all, you know, fairly steady, these are steady state behaviors. But as soon as it became chaotic, the system no longer settled to any kind of equilibrium. It never really repeated itself. It became non-periodic. Okay, so these are a few pictures of what can happen in, um, with, so you can actually see what we mean by laminar flow, right? So this is here, there's a cylinder, which is an obstacle to some kind of flow. Here it's a, it's a gas flow, where we've just, um, we've just marked layers of fluid with, uh, with ink, for instance. So what you see here is, in this case, this is what's known as laminar flow. So where, here, the, uh, here the fluid is running fairly slowly, and you can see that the layers like the, the motion is really layered, and layers never intersect each other. They just remain parallel to each other. So you have, you know, and you, you, you can see how it kind of, it gets, the flow gets deviated by the presence of the cylinder, but everything happens smoothly, right? So here you get the layer being de deviated and comes back like that, and then it continues to run parallel over here. So this is something that's known as laminar flow, which we'll get back to in a second. Then at some point, something funny starts to happen. You get these little swirls that start to collect behind the uh, behind the obstacle. So the flow is still laminar here. So the layers here run continue to run parallel. But here something weird is happening. Right? Basically, stuff that used to just flow like that starts to swirl back around like this. And for the moment, you see there are you know, there are clearly two swirls going around like, around like this. And this is still steady state behavior. This no longer has a steady state. This will actually keep just swirling around. And as you increase the velocity of the, uh, of the fluid, you're going to go through full turbulence. So this is turbulence, right? In this case, you can, barely, you can no longer see any kind of layering of the fluid. It's just you know, little, uh, li little whirls and swirls everywhere. Um, and this, so this would be a picture of the transition, right? Of certain areas in there where you can see what's happening, basically, which is that as the fluid accelerates, it no longer goes into straight, in straight lines. It will start making these little swirls. This is sort of the transition to turbulence. This is full turbulence, and this is also the transition. Right. OK, so why does this kind of system exhibit, why, why does such a, a fluid system exhibit this kind of instability and this kind of chaotic behavior as it becomes turbulent? So the answer comes from something known as the Navier-Stokes equation. So I'm not actually going to 
really solve it or anything. I'm just going to try and describe what each of these terms mean. Because this is quite an important equation, and you can get a feel for what the different terms mean. Right? So u here, this is just the fluid velocity. So it's a vector, which means that it has a direction. So this is the fluid velocity. So the fluid velocity, it, it'll depend on the position and on time. So here the, there's a position, there's time. So if you go back, basically what we're saying is that we're going we're gonna to describe, for instance, this flow like that, right? We have the obstacle here, and we're just going to imagine that the flow can be modeled by a whole bunch of arrows going like this. So here they get deviated a bit. There they get deviated a bit as well, like that. So basically, each one of these arrows this is a vector, basically. This is the velocity describing the velocity of the field. So this describes the velocity of the field, for instance, at this point, which we'll call x1. And we can look at how it goes at a time t1, for instance. And in the case of laminar flow, as we've seen, it's a steady state, right? So this vector doesn't actually depend on time. This will be the same for any time, right? So we're describing the fluid in terms of this field of velocities, right? What kind of speed does the fluid have in different points of the, of the flow? This du by dt, this is the rate of change. So this is how, how the velocity changes with time. Um, you can imagine this with a, with a simpler system, right? Imagine you have, a, um, say, a map like that. So this is just a meteorological map which describes... So this is, say, 9 a.m. This is 10 a.m. And you can imagine that, you know, at first the wind is blowing fairly hard. And then it just kind of dies down a bit. So that's just what this term captures, right? This term tells you that if the weather changes during the day, then you will have a change in wind velocity simply due to the fact that weather has changed over the day. This other term, so this one is one which we write like that. So never mind what the symbols mean. I mean, really, the, you, you'll see that this, this has a kind of intuitive explanation. This is what's known as the convective term. So the convective, ter convective term is how does the, um, how does the motion of the, of the fluid change when I change position? Now imagine this, this, was, you know, this is a map of the, of the wind over a country, for instance. And let's say that this time, it's not the same everywhere, right? So you have less wind in the north, more wind in the south. Which means that if you travel from a point A to a point B, like that, so you're here initially, and you go over there. Then the wind velocity you'll be seeing will change, right? But it hasn't changed because it hasn't changed because of any change in time. It's just changed because you've changed your position, right? And ultimately, so these two terms will describe how the how the velocity field changes, how the wind speed changes over time and over space, basically. So. Imagine you know, you're, in a, you're, in, you're walking around, or rather you're getting in your car going around the country. If you go from point A to point B, but you only arrive at point B at 10 a.m., then there will be a change due to the fact that the weather's changed over the day, and there will be a change due to the fact that you've changed your position, right? So these are what these terms capture, right? This term, the minus nu, is, so this term here, that term captures something different. That term captures viscosity, basically. So what this says, in a nutshell, is that the fluid will lose energy due to the presence of viscosity, right? So for instance, if you have two, if you have two layers of fluid moving at different, uh, at different velocities, they will exchange um, they will exchange energy and you know, the difference will damp down, right? This is a phenomenon known as diffusion as well. Okay, so this term describes velocity, and this term describes, this is the pre pressure gradient. So minus gradient, P over rho. So that's the pressure gradient. What do we mean by that? 
So I don't know if you're familiar with how wind works, but basically, you know, wind is just a displacement of air from regions of high pressure to regions of low pressure. So this thing, this tells you that if there's a difference in pressure so between two points, then you'll create, this will, this will move the fluid around, right? So that's called the pressure gradient, and that's another force acting on the fluid. So this is the force due to viscosity, this is the force due to the pressure gradient, and G here is just the term due to gravity, right? So, so this is just, you know, you can imagine the, the fluid has some kind of weight, so it will be subject to gravity. Okay. So the main thing to take away from this is here is that actually this is pretty much just a straightforward dynamical equation. This describes how the velocity changes in time and space. This describes viscosity acting on the fluid. This describes the action of the pressure gradient on the fluid. And this describes the effect of gravity. This thing is known as the Navier-Stokes equation. Um, it's actually what's known as a millennium problem, meaning that if you can prove or disprove the following statement, that in three space dimensions and time, there exists a vector velocity and a scalar field which are both smooth and globally defined, you get a million dollars. Um, so this is, um, there are a few problems with, like that. They, uh, they're, they're published by the Clay Institute of Mathematics. And you know, they're just puzzles that we don't really know how to solve. Um, and you get, uh, yeah, you get a million dollars if you solve this one. The idea being that despite the seemingly, seeming simplicity of this, of this equation, there is no actual general solution. We don't actually know how to solve this. We don't even know if solutions exist in every case, right? Which you know, is a bit of a problem. And you can already see why this behaves so badly. Why actually this is not at all a straightforward thing to solve. Because here you have a term that depends on u. Here you have a term that depends on u. So u times u here, that's a nonlinear term, right? So if we go back here, that's nonlinear. Okay, so it turns out that this equation does have some simple solutions under some simplifying assumptions. Basically, this is the thing I was describing here. If, if, the, if the velocity is small enough, if there's not too much viscosity under certain con constraints, then you can actually write down an equation for the, for the flow. So for instance, um, if, I, if I even simplify this problem further, let's say I'm looking at the flow of water in a pipe, so that's a water pipe, then basically what I'll do is this. I go to so this describes the speed at which the water is flowing in the pipe. And you can see this is laminar, right? So layers of fluid keep parallel to each other. It's also steady state. This is not going to change with time. And you can also quickly interpret why it is that, there's, that, the, that the water speed has to decrease as it reaches the edges of the pipe, right? Here, you have friction between the layer of fluid and the, um, and the edge of the pipe. So that, has, so that has to slow the fluid down. In the middle, there's less friction so the water can flow freely. So that's you know, one solution of this Navier-Stokes equation. If you basically get rid of the nonlinear term, and if you get rid, um, and if you get rid as well of, uh, of certain complications due to gravity, for instance. So that's just a straightforward solution. This is, so this is linear behavior. Well, all the way back in the, 18th, in the 19th century, a guy called Reynolds actually showed that as you increase the speed of stuff flowing through the pipe, even this will eventually become turbulent, right? Because what's going to happen is that, you know, in reality, the fluid will never run perfectly parallel. Right? Layers of fluid will never run perfectly parallel to each other. What's going to happen is you'll have small deviations up or down. And if it's going fast, if the flow is going fast enough, these deviations will actually be sped up, right? As, the, as this layer encounters, you know, as this layer lifts and encounters this faster layer, it's just going to start swirling around. So we can kind of get a feel for what's happening here, right? Is that you had a stable solution, a stable behavior, but at some point, any small perturbation means that the layers of fluid will start mixing in this chaotic way, right? And this will become turbulent as the speed of, this, uh, of these layers increases. 
But the question is, well, how do you, how do you get from this kind of very neat layered behavior to the turbulent, everything swirling around behavior, right? This is a very old problem in physics. And it's actually still, a, still a, an active domain of, uh, of research. Okay, so essentially we have a problem that is from fluid dynamics. And we wish to study how the system transitions from smooth, stable, regular behavior to the turbulent behavior that we see here. And we start having some kind of idea that this will have to do with you know, how stable to disruption these layers of fluid are. Okay. So basically, this is a, this is was well. This is a very complicated problem. So what Lorenz did in the 60s, when well, he was studying atmospheric physics, he just radically simplified it. He said, well, okay, we're not actually going to be looking at a very at a complicated flow or anything. We're really going to be looking at a two-dimensional flow, and something which is really meant to represent what happens with the weather. So. Basically, the sun heats the ground, which means that the ground temperature and the atmospheric temperature are different, right? This means that also you will have regions of high pressure and regions of low pressure. And what will happen is that, you know, the ground heats up the air here, so the air will increase its buoyancy, it'll lift, and it'll go from regions of high, pre high pressure to low pressure. This is all something you, you know, right? So hot air moves up. It also moves from high pressure to low pressure. And you can see already instinctively that it's going to circulate like that, right? Now, as it turns out, this model already has some interesting features, right? This can already display some very chaotic stuff. In particular, so we're going to take a minute to really describe this model. What we can, and see what we can say about it. Okay, this is not the world's greatest eraser. Okay, so first of all, you know, we're not actually going to be solving these differential equations again, but let's see what all of this means, right? So the first thing, x. x is just, so that these are the variables of the system, right? You remember when we define a dynamical system, we define variables, we define parameters, and we see how the model changes as we modify these things. So x is just the rate of convection. So the rate of convection will roughly be just, you know, how fast this thing is spinning, right? How fast the fluid patches will move around. Y is just the horizontal temperature difference. So this is horizontal temperature variation. Uh, T is temperature variation. In other words, there's going to be some kind of some kind of variation in temperature between these areas and these areas because as the uh, as the air moves around, it's going to exchange energy with its with the surrounding patches of air. So it'll have you know, so it won't have the same temperature as it's just started to drop down here as when it's reached the other point over here. So this is horizontal time, uh, horizontal te temperature variations. And Z is just vertical temperature variations. In other words, the ground heats the air around here. The troposphere cools the air around here. So there'll be a gradient in temperature between this bit and this bit. OK. So we have the variables. We have the parameters. So these parameters tell you about the basic physics of this thing, right? The first parameter is a parameter called sigma. Sigma is just basically linked to, um, what's, well, in fluid dynamics it's called the Prandtl number, but really what it is is how, how, the, how a patch of air will exchange energy with its surroundings by either exchange, exchanging heat, so thermal energy, or exchanging momentum, meaning, meaning losing speed to viscosity. So this thing is proportional to the ratio of viscosity to what's known as thermal diffusivity. So thermal diffusivity just means the capacity of a, um, the capacity of a body to exchange heat with its, uh, with its surrounding. So for instance, um, actually it's thermal productivity rather. So for instance, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, if it's cold in the winter and you put your hand on a piece of wood, 
it doesn't feel too cold. If you put your hand on a piece of metal, it feels very cold. But the thing is, they're both at the same temperature because you're not measuring temperature with your hand, you're measuring heat exchange. So this is linked to thermal conductivity, right? Because metal has a high thermal conductivity, so you lose heat very quickly to it, whereas wood has a lower thermal conductivity, so you lose heat slower, which is basically thermal conductivity will be yeah, how neighboring, if you have two neighboring patches of air, of fluid, and they have different temperatures, how they'll exchange heat, right? Will they exchange heat effect efficiently, or will it be a slow process? Viscosity will tell you how they exchange momentum, how their speed changes. If you, have, you know, if you have one patch going fast, one patch going slow, well, if there's no viscosity, then they'll just keep going at their, you know, regular, at their initial velocities. If there's viscosity, what will happen is that the patch that's going fast is going to give energy to the patch that's going slow, which is basically the effect, which, which will have the effect of changing the speed of both layers of uh, fluid. So viscosity really has to do with that, right? Viscosity is how do neighboring patches of fluid with different velocities interact, exchange momentum. Right, so this is the first parameter. The second parameter is linked to buoyancy. So buoyancy is something you all have as well, some kind of intuition for. Uh, basically, you know that uh, as things get hotter, they tend to become less dense, and therefore, you know, they rise up. So this is kind of, you know, this is basically a hot air balloon works like that, right? So buoyancy will have something to do with the general, um, the density of the fluid, and it will have something to do as well with the temperature, right? Because as temperature increases, so does the buoyancy. Okay, so the first parameter is something to do with viscosity and thermal conductivity. Second one is buoyancy. And the last one is actually the most straightforward one, beta. Beta just has to do with the dimensions of the system. So basically, you know, how big is the, how large is the, is the um, how large is the gap between the ground and the troposphere, right? And the dynamics of the system, so these are the differential equations. So remember, d by dt just means rate of change. So the rate of change of the variable x depends on the viscosity and uh, on this, uh, this ratio of viscosity thermal conductivity. It will also depend on the temperature difference, and it will depend on the convection rate. So this bit, that's actually linear, right? Well, at least it appears linear, because there's x here and x here. Um, this kind of, you can kind of make sense of this uh, in a fairly straightforward way, right? Which is, imagine there's no temperature difference, right? So, so the temperature is the same horizontally, but there's a convection rate. So basically, the convection rate is going to change with, you know, basically the, the rate of change of the convection rate will be linked to the current convection rate itself. These two, these tell you how the temperature changes, uh, with the, how, the t the, how the temperature gradients, horizontal and vertical, change with time. And you can imagine that they'll, they'll change because, you know, air moves around. So if you have a lot of if you have a lot of warm air coming down here and cooler air being around here, then the temperature gradient on the horizontal axis will increase. And there will also be an increase in temperature gradient along the vertical axis because you have, well, you'll have, for instance, cooler or hotter air here, cooler or hotter air here. Okay. So these are the dynamical equations. And you can already see where the nonlinear terms are, right? Here, this thing depends on x and y, right? So this is a second order term, right? It contains two variables multiplying each other. Whereas, you know, this stuff, sigma times x, that's linear. It only contains the first power of x. This contains basically a second, second power of the variables, x times y. OK. So roughly, let's describe the dynamics of the system kind of with our, with our hands, right? So the ground is hot. Air is heated because of the convection rate. So the the air will move. The patch of air will move around here, and its buoyancy means that it'll lift. As it lifts, it, re, it, uh, it it encounters regions of lower temperature, so it starts cooling down. And as it cools down, it decre its buoyancy decreases. It comes back down here. Now, in a very straightforward way, this system is going to display different behavior depending on how big the temperature difference is between the troposphere and the ground. So the first solution that's the most obvious one, so this is, for instance, the cool layer. This is the hot layer. And you can imagine a point where actually the difference between these two is not very large. So what happens is that 
the system will just remain in place. There won't actually be any movement. This will be static, because what happens is that you just have a sort of gradient, a steady gradient in, in temperature. So you have some slightly hotter air here, but it's actually, here you have slightly cooler, but actually, if this difference, if the difference between, in temperature between these two layers is small enough, then actually viscosity will prevent anything from moving. The, the buoyancy of the hot air layer won't be enough to drag itself through the, uh, through the upper layers because viscosity dominates, right? So when viscosity dominates, nothing moves around, right? You just have, uh, you just have some fluid which doesn't move with just slightly hotter air at the bottom, slightly cooler air at the top. So obviously, this is a very stable solution, but also not very interesting to meteorologists, right? Because this, I mean, th this displays no, dynamic, no dynamical behavior of interest. Then you have the thing that's described here. As the te temperature difference increases, then instead of having a simple layering of fluid, uh, fluid layers with different temperatures, you start having the convection that's described here. But okay, so this is the first interesting thing that happens. But now imagine, as the temperature difference between top, and, between top and bottom increases, well, you'll find that actually this middle layer now has a sufficient temperature difference between, now there's a sufficient temperature difference between this layer and this layer, that actually the convection starts happening at a different scale. Now, we also have a convection roll that goes like that. Meaning that, you know, ultimately, this physical system doesn't know that it's got, you know, that it's heated at the bottom and, uh, and cooled at the top. Right? What it sees is that in this, in this bit, the temperature difference is between these two layers is already large enough that you can start circulating between these two layers. So this is what's going to happen, right? Instead of having one convection roll, you're just going to have two. And you know, guess what happens as you increase the temperature further? Well, you'll start getting another, um, an another bifurcation, as it's called, where within these layers, things will double up again. And the thing is, you can, you can kind of tell here, is that as, as these things between, between become smaller and smaller, this whole thing is going to become disorderly, right? This is going to be one way to transition to a system that's chaotic, basically. The, um, the layers, the, you know, the convection rolls are going to get smaller and smaller, they'll interact with each other, and suddenly everything just starts flowing around in weird and complicated ways. So what I want you to sort of get from this is that as you increase the parameter value, so the difference between the hot plate and the, well, the hot layer and the cool layer, as you increase this temperature difference, what's happening is that the system kind of, you know, it sort of splits, right? You have, you'll have these, uh, these rolls being generated at smaller and smaller scales. So there's this notion of a bifurcation, so splitting in the behavior. And also you can see that in a way this thing is kind of a question of scale, right? What's going to happen is that the changes are going to be happening on smaller and smaller scales until they happen at pretty much every scale. Because this is the other thing. Just because, you, just because you've created the smaller worlds doesn't mean that you stop the bigger ones. So actually, this system contains all of these. Like when, when we reach this point, we have worlds at every different scale, right? So you have big walls, you have smaller walls within these walls, and even smaller ones within those. So there's a notion of that your system is behaving kind of similarly, but on very different length scales. And this is going to be something key to, uh, to study the, um, uh, the emergence of chaos. Okay, so this is just a, a straightforward application of this. Uh, there are, because um, the, uh, the Lorenz system can also apply to some degree to, uh, to systems like, you know, this is boiling, boiling, boiling water in a pot. So hot layer, cool layer, and convection current. You could actually do this experiment um, under certain conditions. If you put a wooden block here, it will just start going to the sides because of these convection rolls. And you also know that you know, if you increase the temperature too much, you'll start seeing turbulent flow around here. Uh, that's also a kind of simple model for how the Earth's crust works, right? You have the core of the Earth that heats up fluid. You get convection currents because of this, uh, of these, uh, these instabilities, and this pushes around the tectonic plates, right? So that's, you know, that's one, uh, that's one model of how, uh, of how tectonic plates work. You can guess that this is probably not going to be quite as chaotic as the, um, as the atmosphere for a very simple reason, right? Which is uh, basically, you know, the difference between magma and air 
is that magma is way, way, way more viscous. So if a fluid is very viscous, it's going to have some kind of difficulty in moving around on smaller and smaller length scales, right? So this is where this, uh, this parameter kicks in. Okay. So there's another analog to, uh, to this Lorenz system, which is a little bit funny, but it like, kind of illustrates neatly the dynamics of it, right? Because, okay, so this is what's known as a Mulcus wheel. The idea is this, and it has exactly the same dynamics as the Lorenz system. You have a constant flow of water here, and you have buckets. So these buckets around the wheel, they have little holes at the bottom, right? So they can lose, they, they lose water gradually. And the idea is that, well, there's a first, the, the, the first solution is not interesting, right? If the holes are big enough, so if energy loss, so through viscosity, is big enough, basically what happens is that, you know, you fill in the bucket, but the bucket immediately leaks, so the water wheel's just not gonna move at all, right? So th this was the first case that we had, right? That was the case where actually nothing was moving around, you just had, you know, a sort of steady state. Now, let's shut down, close the holes in the, in the leaky buckets a little bit. Now what's happening is that one of the buckets starts getting filled, the, the, the wheel moves slowly, and if the wheel moves slowly enough, what's happening is that the buckets get filled in turn, right? So they get filled in turn, the, move, the, the wheel moves like this, this bucket gets filled and moves like that, so this thing just kind of goes to the bottom. As the full buckets reach the bottom, they've leaked enough, and they've leaked enough, um, enough water that they're light enough to come back up, right? So this circulation, where the water wheel is just going to be turning around regularly, that's this behavior. But then, well then you can see that as we increase the rate of flow, what's going, some funny stuff is going to start happening, right? Because imagine I've really turned the tap way up this time, and this first water bucket is getting filled, filled up immediately. So it gets filled up immediately, and it drives the entire wheel to go down like that. None of the other buckets have had time to fill. So this bucket is just moving up all the way back here. None of the other buckets are filled. So what's happening now is that this thing is going to move in the other direction. And basically there will come a point where this system will start to behave chaotically. Because it'll go all the way up in that direction, then it'll flip back. Then you know, maybe one of the other buckets has enough time to be, to be filled, and the wheel just kind of spins in another direction. So there's, um, it's difficult to uh, get a feel for what this, uh, this looks like with just words. Uh, so there's actually a, a neat little animation. Oh. Okay, let's get this. Ah. Oh, wait, I don't seem to have... Yes, I do. Great. Okay, I'm going to find this little animation. So that's known as a Marcus wheel. And funnily enough, you'd think that this has very little to do with, uh, with, the, uh, with the atmosphere, but actually basically it has the same equations as the, uh, as the Lorentz system, which is why it's used as an analog. Okay, so here's, here's the water wheel. Okay. So again, what we're doing here, we're looking at two different water wheels which have been started out at almost the same initial position, right? One of the water wheels starts with one degree, from the one degree from the vertical, the other one starts two degrees from the vertical. And what we're going to do here is that this is going to be plotting the trajectory of the center of mass of the wheel, right? So when all the buckets, um, when all the buckets are empty, the center of mass is just here. Well, when this, when this bucket is just on top, it's still here, but if, say, this bucket were to move here, then the center of mass would shift around here. So what we're looking at here is the movement of the wheel itself and the movement of the center of mass of the wheel as the buckets get filled and, uh, and emptied. Okay, so this, one, this is what it looks like. So, this is filling. See, this one's already reversing. This one's reversed, but a little later. At first, you see the trajectories are more or less similar. But we're going to see that, with most, as with most chaotic systems, at some point, there will be no way to, you know, you, you won't be able to tell that these two things were started more or less at the same time. So, right. It's moving, but now this one's moving in one direction while the other one is moving in the next, in the other. You can, you can see that these trajectories here don't look particularly neat. Like, they seem to have some kind of behavior whereby they sort of oscillate between these two points, right? But not in any kind of regular or repetitive pattern, right? Um, 
So this is a hallmark of chaos, right? You started out with a very small initial difference, and now the water wheels are behaving completely differently, and they don't seem to be, re to be settling in any kind of regular pattern, right? OK. So enough of being hypnotized by the wheels. We can have a look at what the trajectory of the center of mass looks like. So this is, um, so this is a plot of what happens to the center of mass as time evolves, right? as time changes. Basically, you start out here, and it moves around like this. And you can see something complicated is happening. But roughly, you see that it spends a lot of time kind of circling these two points. right? These two things, so this is actually what we'll come to, to know as a, uh, a strange attractor, meaning that the system does seem to hover around these points. It never reaches them. And it never actually repeats the way in which it circles these uh, these points. So it doesn't just do a simply figure of eight. Fi fi uh, it doesn't do a simple figure of eight motion, right? That so that would be periodic de behavior, right? Just going round and round every one of the points. But it doesn't do that. What it does is goes you know round a few times this one, then back over there, then maybe once or twice here, then it'll go back here. Maybe it'll circle ten times here before coming back around here. So there's no way to predict really how long it's going to spend around one of the poles of the attractor here, with the only thing that we know, and this is actually why chaos is useful, because we only, the only thing we can tell about this system is that it is going to spend more time around these bits than around these bits, right? Which is already useful information, right? It's like, obviously, you can't tell where the system is going to be at a given time, but you can now predict how long the system is going to spend around a given area of its, um, of its uh, phase space, of its states. OK, so this is our first view of what's known as a, um, uh, as a, as a strange attractor. And we've seen that in the case of the, the convection, right, that what's happening is a kind of doubling up of behavior. So this is what's known as period doubling, a period doubling bifurcation, which we kind of saw with the logistic map earlier, right? If you recall, um, so that was just a quick recap, right? The logistic map, it gives you the population next year as a function of the population this year. And here you have. Uh, a, a parameter r, which is the rate of starvation. Right? I re as we recall, for certain values of the starvation rate, this thing is very chaotic. Right? It's not very predictable. Um, it oscillate, it's just never really settled to a, to a steady state. OK. So this is also something that we saw in the third lecture, but I want to remind you of it slightly. So basically, we saw that for certain values of the starvation parameter, the population settles into periodic behavior, right? It just goes up, down, up, down in a regular fashion. And if we were to look at the spectrum of the fluctuations, so what kind of, with what kind of frequency the population oscillates, then this is just one line here. There's only one frequency, right? The frequency is here, there's a peak. As you increase the parameter value, as you increase the starvation rate, you start getting other peaks. So this is the period doubling, right? Where suddenly now the population doesn't oscillate between two points, it oscillates between four points, right? It goes one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So now you, have, now you have two different oscillations. So this is the first period doubling. And what's gonna happen is as you increase the parameter, you go adding new and new, newer and newer frequencies. So this is now, a you've now quadrupled. So there's a doubling of the doubling. And as this doubling, keeps going on, eventually you reach chaos, where here the, um, uh, you get a frequency spectrum that looks like noise, right? So basically, the system is oscillating at all kinds of different frequencies, and these change with time, right? So if you were to look at this as a film, then these peaks would all be changing with time as well. Okay, so now is the, now is the point at which we will be reusing a bit of what we saw last time, right? Because if you think about it, we can think of the logistic map not so much just as a dynamical system, but in terms of feedback, right? Because this is basically what the, what the map does, right? If we, so if we write down the equation of the, uh, of the logistic map, what does it tell us? So logistic map is here the population next year, proportional to R, population this year, 1 minus xn. So this tells you that in order to get, to get the population next year, you just plug in the value of the population this year. Now, the population at xn plus 1 just gets fed back. So if you want xn plus 2, you just do r xn plus 1, 1 minus xn plus 1. 
So this is an iterative behavior, right? Whatever the current state of the system is, is being fed back into the, into the dynamics. And this is the definition of feedback, right? So there's a neat way of visualizing this with the, um, uh, graphically. So this curve, xn, 1 minus xn, it can be represented as a parabola, right? So like this. So this is a parabola. So this curve, this curve represents xn, 1 minus xn, well, r. And this straight line just represents, so if this is xn plus 1, this is xn. This curve here is just the identity. This represents xn plus 1 equals xn. So basically, if we, if we want to see what's happening here, well, we just have to project, right? So we take an initial value of xn. Let's say we start here. So this is x0. To get the value x1, we just go here. So this is now x1. So what we do, what we do next is that, well, we take this value of x1 here, here. And we repeat the process. This goes back up here. This goes back like that. And we just repeat like this. So essentially, you take an initial value, project it on the parabola, get that on the straight line here, go, to, go down this way, project, get down, project, get down. And this, this behavior here, this already tells you how the system's behaving for this particular value of the parameter. Basically, it starts out here, and then it'll go down until it reaches zero, right? So this bouncing around, this tells you that actually here, this is an attractor. What I mean by that, by that is that if I start out in x0 over here instead of here, I'm going to get the same behavior. x0 is going to up like that, then down, then, down, then, then this way, then down again, and it'll just go down all the way to zero. So this is the most simple behavior of the logistic map. You remember, this just means that your starvation rate is so high that essentially any population you start out with just ends up dying down after a while. Now you can get more interesting behavior. So you increase the, you, you change the R parameter, and well, for a while you just keep getting the same sort of behavior, right? So the parabola here is increasing, but same sort of behavior. So you hit the parabola, you go here, and it just dies down over here. But something interesting starts happening once you hit a particular value of the parameter, which is that instead of oscillating towards a fixed value, what it, well, instead of you know, reaching for a fixed value, it now goes here, 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 and then it hits a kind of cycle. So this is the period two cycle, right? What's happening is that as you reach this point, you then reach this other point, you get fed back here, and you just repeat eternally. So this, this graph actually corresponds to this behavior, right? So here, you have a period two loop. It's just coming back again and again. As you further increase the parameter, well, that's when you reach chaos, right? At this point, really, the, um, the behavior never really settles anywhere. It's just going to keep exploring the entire parabola. If I were to continue plotting these, uh, plotting these curves, it'll just continue doing some weird swirling around with no particular pattern and no particular repetition. So basically, what's important here is that we've located some key features which are generic to dynamical systems, right? Dynamical systems will quite, quite often have what are known as fixed points. So here, this is a fixed point, meaning that if I get uh, if I start out here, I'm going to stay out here. So if my population is initially zero, then my rabbit population is going to stay zero forever. This is not a very interesting fixed point, right? This, though, this is already a slightly more interesting fixed point, because this tells you that actually, if I start out here, I'll reach eventually a fixed level of the population, 
and that's no longer going to change. Once I've reached this point, it stays here. You can still see why that's the case, right? Because this is an intersection between the parabola and the straight line. So here, the, uh, here we have another fixed point. A fixed point can be an attractor, meaning that basically, if I start out in slightly different places, the behavior will tend to converge towards that fixed point. So this was the case of the, uh, in the kind of uh, you know, uh, global death scenario. If I started out here, the initial trajectory wouldn't be the same, right? I'd go like that, tack, 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 tack. So initial trajectory wouldn't be the same, but eventually the population would still die out. In the same way that if I have, if I've, if I've started near around here, then I won't follow exactly the same trajectory, but I will end up closing in on the same cycle. So these things are known as attractors, and an attractor can be one point or it can be two points. So one point here or two points, meaning that basically the behavior, the, um, uh, yeah, meaning that the, uh, the population will just oscillate between these two values over here. Okay, so that's known as a periodic attractor. As we'll see, chaotic systems can have other types of attractors, which are known as the strange attractors, which we'll be seeing at a later date. Okay, so basically rather than plotting the time evolution of the system, this was one of, um, um, this is one actually of Lorenz's finer ideas. He was thinking, well, rather than plotting the time evolution, which seems, you know, kind of difficult to pass, right? Difficult to get information out of it. What we're going to do is we're actually going to plot the evolution, not in terms, well, we're going to plot the fixed points and how their position evolves as a function of the parameter. Let me show you what I mean by that. So here, the y-axis is just the position of the fixed point. And here, this is the parameter value. So the parameter is R, the star starvation rate. What did we see? At first, the fixed point is just zero, right? For a very low value of the parameter, there's no, you know, the, the only fixed point is everything dies where at the origin. As, as we increase the value of the parameter, what we're starting to see is that the fixed point is no longer at the origin, it's now at some constant value along the parabola. So now the fixed point is not at zero, it's around here. And what's happening is that as the parameter increases, the fixed point will change its location like that. And then something weird happens. Around here, this is the first, so this is the first time you reach here. So now there's not one fixed point, there are two, because now we have a loop. So instead of having one fixed point, we oscillate between these two. So this is a bifurcation, meaning that instead of steadily going towards one value of the population, we will be oscillating between two values of the population. And as the parameter increases, then you know, these values will change, but the broad behavior remains the same, right? We oscillate between two points. But here's what's gonna happen. At some point here, this is also going to change. So now we get the second bifurc bifurcation. And well, you can see where this is going. It's gonna keep doubling like that, right? Until eventually, what you get is something that looks like that. So this is quite possibly the, one of the most famous um, graphs in all of chaos theory. This is the bifurcation diagram for the uh, logistic map. And what it tells you is what I've just shown you here, right? At, the first, at first, there's only one fixed point, then two fixed points, then four, and then as you, know, as you start adding further and further uh, bifurcations, then everything becomes very confused, right? Because all of these fixed points start overlapping with each other, and this is the re these are the regions where you find chaos, right? Now, you'll note something really interesting about, this, um, uh, about this, uh, this diagram, which is that even in the chaotic system, there are periods where it's no longer chaotic, right? So in this window, for instance, in this window here, you only have three fixed points. You have here, here, and here. So this is a weird feature of chaos, is that you never get a, a chaotic system is never chaotic everywhere. It actually has regions of chaos interspersed with regions of order. And if you were to zoom in on these regions of, uh, of chaos, you would still get the same structure, right? There's a sense that this is scaling, right? If I, if I were to zoom in on this, I would get something that looks a little bit like the, gro the broader structure, right? 
This is also the reason that um, the most, uh, basically the term chaos theory originates from this one paper, which has a really funny title. It's called Period 3 Implies Chaos. Because it's basically Lee and York, uh, who are mathematicians, um, they proved that if you had any kind of, if, it, if, it, if in the behavior of your system, you had one period three loop, so this one, right, for instance, if this thing exists, then your system has to be chaotic. There is, which is kind of odd, right? Because you, you don't really see necessarily the link between having you know, oscillations between three points as being you know, necessarily meaning that the system is incredibly uh, is, is chaotic. But that is, you know, that, that is what, uh, what York and Lee proved, that if you have this period three loop, then the entire system is chaotic. OK, so if you can read this, right? This is fixed point. This is period two, this is period four, and this is period three, right? And if a period three loop exists, then all the other kinds of loops also have to exist, so the system is chaotic. We'll have a look a little bit later at this thing as well, right? So this here marks the, the position of the different bifurcations. And we'll see that there's some interesting things to say about that, which is the Feigenbaum number. So basically, this guy's Mitch Feigenbaum. Um, back in the days, uh, he was a um, so he was a physicist working in Los Alamos. Uh, his main thing was that um, he spent a lot of time staring at computers. Basically, uh, so he was a very strange man. Uh, for a while, he decided that he wanted to function on a 23-hour day period. So basically, his day kept being offset by an hour every day until he was you know waking up at two in the morning and you know, living his life in complete you know opposition to what everyone else around Los Alamos was doing. But Los Alamos was a pretty weird place around that time anyway, so no one really noticed. Um, basically what people noticed was he, he seemed to be making some very strange use of computer time, in that for a physicist, he was very interested in these kinds of simple mathematical maps. So this is just a mathematical object, right? This doesn't really capture any physical system. Um, but he was just studying these things obsessively uh, until he figured out something very weird, which is that if you were to compute the ratio between the following, between successive bifurcations, that ratio is a constant, right? That ratio is this thing called the Feigenbaum number. But okay, so there's a ratio between, you know, if you do, basically if you do this length divided by this length, this length divided by this length, this length is divided by this length, you get a constant ratio, right? So there's a kind of like geometrical scaling here. Okay, so that's kind of intriguing, but uh, nothing to write home about. What he found though, was that if instead of using the logistic map, so instead of using a parabola here, he used a completely different type of function. So a curve that is completely different to, to this one, which has, a completely, which has a different shape. So for instance, a sine curve, right? He found that actually, you got exactly the same type of bifurcation diagram. And not only that, but the geometric ratio between the bifurcations, successive bifurcations, remained constant. So basically, he figured out that these, um, that these bif bifurcations are somehow universal, right? That it doesn't really matter what function you were using here. So here you we were using a parabola, but he also did the same experiment with a sine, he did the same experiment with a whole bunch of different functions, and he found that for a very broad class of functions, you still always observe the same behavior, period doubling, and with successive period doublings coming in this constant ratio called the Feigenbaum number which is a very odd thing, right? So you'd, you'd really, you know, considering the method which we've adopted for figuring out the fixed points and stuff, we'd really expect that this, that the broad behavior has something to do with the shape of this curve, right? And it turns out not to. It turns out that actually, like, this is just completely, this is completely generic behavior for any kind of nonlinear, uh, for any kind of nonlinear system that has period doubling bifurcations, which is a lot of them. Okay, so here we're going to try and explore um, what the uh, what period doubling kind of means on a more physical basis, because I think it's kind of difficult to get an, to, to get a sort of like strong physical sense of what these things mean. And to do that, we're going to quickly revisit our old friend, the Duffing oscillator. So you remember, the Duffing oscillator is just um, a spring which is nonlinear, so it doesn't respond doesn't respond proportionally to how you pull it. And this uh, so this thing is a driven oscillator. It has a a driving, a driving force pulling and pushing the spring. And what we saw is that it, it exhibited the same kind of period doubling uh, behavior as the logistic map, right? You have you know, regular periodic motion, then regular periodic motion with period two, and then you, know, you increase, you get period four, and eventually you get chaos. But this isn't, re this isn't, so we know that this goes through the same 
period doubling route is the logistic map, but we're going to be interested in the behavior, really, of its fixed points and attractors, in particular, in the potential of the duffing oscillator. OK, so what do we mean by that? As you recall, so as you recall, when we were looking at a very simple harmonic oscillator, you could look at it in terms of exchange of kinetic and potential energy. So basically, this here, that's the potential of a simple harmonic oscillator. So this is potential energy. This is distance to the equilibrium point. So this is the equilibrium. OK. So you remember, simple harmonic motion is pretty straightforward. If I move up away from the equilibrium point, I'm gaining potential energy. So if I drop the, mo the, uh, the little mass here, then it's just going to pick up speed until it reaches the equilibrium point of the oscillator. So here, it has maximum speed, but it no longer has any potential energy. Then it climbs back up, regains potential energy, but loses speed, and then goes back like that, right? So you can see why the simple harmonic oscillator has the behavior it does, basically, because it's really just oscillating around its equilibrium point. So this is simple harmonic motion, right? But the thing is that the, the, um, the duffing oscillator, so hom simple harmonic motion, that's EP equals 1 half of kx squared. But the duffing, duffing oscillator has a slightly different kind of behavior, right? It, has, it still has a term that's proportional to x squared, but it also has a term that's proportional to x cubed, well, x to the 4, actually. But here's the weird thing about the duffing oscillator. This potential, x, dp, so at first, for certain values of alpha and beta, this potential looks exactly like the simple harmonic oscillator. So for certain values of alpha and beta, the duffing oscillator just looks like this. So it still hovers around an equilibrium position here. The shape of this thing is different, is slightly different, because there's a power of 4 here. The shape is different, but it still does the same thing as the harmonic oscillator, right? For certain values of alpha and beta, this thing is just going to, you know, the system is just going to oscillate around here.